Good afternoon. I'm Catherine Marshall. I'm at the Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs at Georgetown University, and I'm also executive director of the World Faiths Development Dialogue. We were delighted and frankly somewhat surprised at the substantial interest in this session. Uh, there were far more uh, RSVPs than we were able to manage in the uh, Riggs Library where we had originally intended. So thank you all for your interest, which we take very much to heart, and also thank you for your flexibility. Uh, let me uh, welcome you to Georgetown. Uh, you're in one of Georgetown's spaces, the Copley Hall here, as you can see. It's sort of full of history, uh, and you're here for what we consider a very historic event. Uh, this is the first of its kind that we are aware of, where there has been a concerted effort to look at the issues of uh, peace, uh, religion, and women, uh, looking at the three. <coughs> So let me first tell you what it is that we're going to do this afternoon. And then uh, the moderators will make some very brief remarks. Uh, we have spent the past two days uh, in an intensive and very participatory uh, discussion uh, with, a, with an action orientation. Uh, we've had a group of about 35 people, women and men, coming from several continents, a number of countries, uh, with experience all over the world. Uh, they are uh, academics, um, scholars, uh, people from the policy community, uh, religious leaders, uh, uh, and practitioners, people who have spent their lives as the criterion of one of the, one of the people here is basically putting their lives at risk. Uh, in the interests of peace. So really a quite extraordinary group. Uh, in this session, uh, we wanted to give you as much as we could a flavor of the different voices and the different experiences. So we're trying something that is, again, something of an experiment. We want you to hear as many voices as possible, and that is why this is described as a fishbowl. Essentially, you're seeing the final stages of the conversation that we've been having for the past days. I don't expect that there will be space for a lot of uh, interaction and, and mm -hmm. debating, uh, but you will hear the voices uh, and see the uh, images of not all, but many of the people here. Not all, because a number of people are already on airplanes uh, going to different corners uh, of the world. So what we're going to do is first to give you a very brief set of introductions of what's brought us here, uh, what we're doing. Uh, and the three of us, um, myself, uh, Susan Hayward, and Catherine, uh, Kathleen Keenest will essentially, from the Georgetown, the World Face Development Dialogue, and the United States Institute of Peace, give you a bit of an introduction. Uh, we will then hear from seven among the participants who will address um, some questions, and I will be moderating, so I will sort of frame the three questions. Uh, we then have, and they have an absolutely strict four minutes to do this, each. Um, we then have asked those who are still here from the rest of the group uh, to give you one minute each, uh, <laughs> focused on their action ideas, because this is the beginning of a process. So again, you'll get some sense of the uh, nature of the group. Uh, and then we're going to open it for comments and questions. We have to be out of here at 4.45, because there's another event coming. <laughs> and everyone who is here is welcome to the reception, which will be beside the Riggs Library in the next building over. So I hope that that's clear. So essentially, we have you have uh, your witnesses to the discussion that we've been having uh, in the first instance. 
uh, and each of the participants will introduce themselves within their four minutes and one minute. <laughs> uh, and uh, then we will uh, open it up to you to, to ask questions. And I think I can say safely that if anyone goes over one minute in their questions, will also um, basically uh, have the executioner's mark, which is basically this. Uh, to give you a very uh, brief uh, kickoff, uh, the issues, the issue that we've been discussing uh, is peace, religion, and women. Uh, so it is, in a sense, a triad. So each one of these issues, I don't think we need to highlight, is a highly complex issue. And each of the dyads within that, in other words, each group, whether it's peace and religion, peace and women, women and religion, is in itself very complex. But we started from the hypothesis that in the discussions about peace and about peace and religion, uh, that there is a very striking absence of women's voices and of women's faces in the public image, but with a hypothesis that there is a great deal that's happening behind. So that is part of what we set out to document. In preparation for this meeting, uh, we have talked to most of the participants and some people who could not be here, but who are very much part of the network. And on the website of the Berkeley Center, uh, but also, I think, on the USIP website. We'll link to your site. We have what are really a remarkable set of resources, which are in-depth discussions with about 30 people. And I think there are some examples of these interviews outside. We also have done a brief background uh, report, which gives you some uh, insights, some previews of the interviews, plus the way that we frame them. And those also will be available. And we will be following up, completing the, this set of interviews, and we'll be following up with reports, uh, which we will, again, uh, maintain on the website. And the reason I'm highlighting this is that we welcome very much for you to be part of this conversation, uh, part of our learning process. Uh, just to kick off the sort of introductory framing uh, comments, uh, I said that we're talking about peace, we're talking about religion, we're talking about um, women and how the three of them go together. But each one of these is, is complex in itself. So just to start on that, uh, one of the particularly complex questions that we faced is what is peace? Uh, because there is, uh, at one level, a sense that peace is when people are not at war, uh, when they are not uh, actually fighting and killing each other. Uh, but there is also the sense of positive peace. Uh, and in many of the stories which we have heard, and you'll get some glimpse of these stories, you get a sense that people, and women and men, but perhaps particularly women, take a view of peace that is broader than the absence of conflict and the absence of war. Uh, the notion uh, that peace is about justice, that peace is about human rights, uh, that peace is about sustainability. And therefore, we have been wrestling throughout the two days of how to define the questions that we're talking about on peace without it becoming so broad that we lose focus. Um, but it is worth, I think, emphasizing that peace is very much about a much broader set of issues than simply about conflict. Uh, so that is just a, a first introduction to the complexities around what it is we're talking about. So I'm going to turn now to Susan Hayward, who will introduce herself and pick it up from there. She is the co-moderator and in many respects the inspiration as well as my partner and friend. So, 
Welcome to all of you here. Um, I'm, with, uh, I'm with USIP in the Religion and Peacemaking Program, and we were a co-sponsor of this um, symposium. And this is very much in keeping with the, the mandate of the Religion and Peacemaking Program at USIP, which is about leveraging the power of religious communities and religious actors in um, peacemaking activities particularly in places where there is divides between the religious communities and religion is being used to instigate violence. We do this um, through training religious actors in conflict resolution skills, we helping to incorporate peace education into religious schools by facilitating interreligious dialogue and action towards building justice and peace. So this two-day symposium has been well within our mandate and it comes directly out of some of our experiences on the ground. And I think particularly my experiences on the ground is the only woman in the um, religion and peacemaking program at, at USIP. Because <laughs> in the field of religious peacemaking, or broadly, and here I'm gonna be speaking, I should say, particularly to the dyad of religion and peacemaking briefly. And then my, my colleague, Kathleen, who's the um, gender and peace, who heads the gender and peace building initiative at, at USIP, will focus a little bit on the woman and peacemaking um, dyad. But in the field of religious peacemaking, there's often a great deal of focus on traditional religious clergy and their authority and their leverage and being able to mobilize communities for peace and in order to strengthen religious narratives in support of peace. Um, but oftentimes what I see on the ground is that while the, the elite religious clergy who are often male in hierarchies, in religious hierarchies around the world, are able to do quite a bit through their issuing of declarations and statements and support when it comes down to it, a lot of the work that's being done on the ground, implementing some of those visions that are in the declarations that come out, are being done by lower and middle range religious clergy and by religious lay communities, including a lot of women who are involved in, um, in actually doing the religious peacemaking in the field. A few points that have come out in our discussion that I just want to make sure to lift up at the beginning, and there are so many wonderful points that came out of our discussion, I'm just picking a few here. But one is that women, despite traditionally not being a part of religious hierarchies, still have authority within traditions. They shape religious interpretations and motivations that, sh that in turn shape attitudes and behaviors in conflict zones. And they do this sometimes for good and sometimes for ill. What I mean here is that women in their communities, within their families, are interpreting religious traditions, are emphasizing particular religious values, and are emphasizing particular religious responses to conflict and injustice around them that influences those who are around them. So they're shaping religious narratives that influence conflict in local communities. Two, we talked a bit about um, how women demonstrate sort of a keen ability or willingness or energy to reach across different religious and ethnic divides in divided societies. And we debated a bit about the causes for this. We wanted to shy away from essentializing women and essentializing gender as being nurturers and compassionate, and this is what leads them to reach across divides. And we focus to some degree on women's experiences and realities that allow them to serve this role and um, spoke a bit about the potential for their ability to do this being in part because they are seen as less threatening by armed actors and they have a degree of protection because of their invisibility and their marginalization to make some of these risky um, bridges across divides. Three, um, we looked a bit of, at the experiences of women in creating mass mobilizations in Africa especially, but also Latin America. And we noted their ability to mobilize large protests with less danger to themselves. So women can gather as a large group in order to um, uh, show opposition to armed actors or to state governments in particular situations. And they're seen as less threatening. Again, that theme of women being able to do some things in part because a bunch of women getting together is less threatening to armed actors than a bunch of men getting together, a bunch of young men in particular. Um, but also the means by which they are sometimes able to, to mobilize these large masses through their religious institutions and their religious affiliations and are afforded some protection by doing it through their religious communities. And for one theme that came up repeatedly was the divide between secular and religious 
women, which is growing particularly in the Middle East, was noted by a number of our participants. Um, one of our participants who can't be here today is one of my colleagues at USIP, is director of our Iraq programs, Manal Omar. She spoke about the ways in which in Iraq she has seen a growing secular fundamentalism on one side and a growing religious extremism, extremism on, one si on the other side, excuse me, that has left few, left a smaller space for women who fall in between those two extremes. And they're being forced to decide between adherence to their, their faith and their values or adherence to an extreme form of secularism that doesn't allow them to bring their faith into the discussions, into public discussions. Um, so we talked a little bit about how to preserve that middle ground and to try to bridge the divide between secular and religious women, particularly in a way that can help further the common issues that women share from both sides and to prevent a fragmentation of, of women's movement. So I'll stop there and I'll hand it off to Kathleen Keenest, who's also been a supporter of this um, initiative at USIP. Thank you, Susan, and thank you, Catherine, and welcome to all our guests here today. I'm going to speak very briefly because the real gender and peace building is sitting right here in front of you. I think what uh, I would like to dish suggest to you that this field is really about strategic peace building. Because so much of when we think of war and security, it really has been a domain that we automatically assume to be about men. And one of the things that has happened over the last decade, uh, not only with all these women sitting here, but with other kind of institutional policies like the UN's Security Council Resolution 1325 that noted that war and conflict has an inordinate impact on the lives of women. And in fact, when they begin to count casualties, 70% of the casualties of war are women and children. But so much of what we note is our soldiers and our warriors who are those who have been killed. And what we're doing in the gender and peace building field is trying to expand our aperture and understand not only the victimization and the impact on women every day in everyday lives, but also their unbelievable ability of bringing power and protection on the ground in everyday lives. And so what you're going to hear next are these stories of not only lives that have been victimized by war, but also lives that have been changed and made different and been empowered through conflict to come out the other side. The fact that these three triads are together, I think, is important. We often, in Washington, in the policy world, we do often forget women, but we especially forget religion. You rarely hear the term religion and security in the same sentence, in terms of a way, a policy process. So with that, I'm going to, uh, again, welcome you all. We look forward to seeing you again and turn it back over to our moderators. Thank you. Hopefully that's a tantalizing open, opening for all of you. We're, we've divided the next section into addressing three of the questions uh, that we focused on over the past uh, days. So the first question is responding to the fact that so much work that women are doing for peace is not well known. One term is that it is invisible, uh, that uh, it is not written about, uh, it has not been studied, it is rarely celebrated, with some notable exceptions. Uh, so the first question is, what is actually happening with women engaging in work for peace defined in the different ways. And the first person who will speak to that is Andrea Blanche. Uh, and then uh, we will hear from Amina Rasul uh, Bernando. So. 
So I'm and is this is this on? Yeah, I'm Andy Blanche, and I'm the founder and director of the Center for Religious Tolerance. Uh, we do two things basically: we support people-to-people -people interfaith peace work in Israel and Palestine, and we support religious tolerance activities here in the states. Um, we don't usually uh, think about traditional Palestinian Muslim women as being a force for peace in the Middle East. But I'm going to tell you a story about a program uh, that's happening right now in Israel uh, that's, uh, that was initiated by a traditional Palestinian Muslim woman named Ibtisam uh, Mahamid. Uh, Ibtisam is from a little village called Ferdis, a traditional Arab village in the Galilee. Uh, and like many villages, uh, Arab villages, it's isolated, it's in a valley, they look up at Zikron Yaakov, which is the Jewish town on the hillside, uh, and, and they tend to be poor, and the women uh, usually don't uh, finish high school, they marry young, they have many children. Ibtisam had been involved in interfaith work, and she wanted to give something back to the women in her village. So she started a program, and the first thing she did was to create a team that included Jewish feminists from Israel, international Christians, and Muslim women to design the program and to access resources. In the beginning, uh, she could only round up 12 women to come to the project. She actually had to go around and uh, talk their husbands into letting them attend. Uh, and the women really didn't even know why they were coming. Um, but about two months into the program, they had an aha experience, and they started to realize that they as women could have goals of their own. And it took off after that. The first thing they did, it was fascinating, they went to Ibtisam and said, Ibti, you blew it, the most important thing you didn't give us. We need a Hebrew instructor. How can we be empowered uh, women in the state of Israel if we don't speak the language. So we got them a, a Hebrew instructor. Um, th by three or four months into the program, the first woman got a job uh, in Zikron Yaakov, first time ever a woman from the village had a job there. And about that time, um, they started to have some questions about their religious identity. As the women described it, they were feeling a conflict between what they felt happening inside. They said, we feel like we're becoming better Muslims because the, the prophet talked about education as important and, and service, and these are the things we're learning how to do. But um, many of the things we're doing, we've been told that, that Muslim women don't do. So what did they do? They brought in some Quranic scholars who could help them sort out what was really in the Quran from what was just cultural habits. Uh, and from then on, um, they framed everything in the program within Islam, which allowed them to bring their husbands and their families and their village along with them in this journey of empowerment. Um, by 12 months into the program, they were uh, ready to take another whole leap. It was about the time of the Obama election. They had been following it closely. And there was a mayoral election going on in Faradis. So they decided to get involved. I'll cut a long story short. They uh, were amazing. And they actually elected the only uh, candidate who was women friendly. And he has since uh, set up a women's division in the municipality of Faradis. Uh, we're now at the end of the third year of the program. And uh, at this point, there are four additional Arab villages that have come to Ibtisam and want to start programs. And most importantly, the women have identified their next step. They want to get together with the women of Zikron Yaakov to start discussing with them what are the factors um, that have kept them apart. Um, so, and that couldn't have happened two years ago. My name is Amina Rasul Bernardo. I'm uh, from the Philippines. I'm, my group is called the Philippine Council for Islam and Democracy. And I'd like to, uh, to tell you about what we're doing in Muslim Mindanao. The first thing I think that we should really keep in mind, we don't have a religious war in Mindanao. It's always um, seen as Muslim versus Christian, but actually it's not. It's an ethnic conflict. Um, the tribes are majority Muslim, 
They have a, a war against state over sovereignty and over oppression. And that has been going on for 50 years. However, over time, it's gathered religious scholars, uh, especially after 9-11, where um, God has been hijacked and God is now fighting on the side of the extremists. The religious, the Muslim religious, especially in Muslim Mindanao, are extremely influential. But unfortunately, they had not been really organized to work on peace and development in their community levels. They're very good in the sermons, and they're able to exhort their followers to uh, do certain things. Um, but when it came to actual peace and development community work, they were not organized, unlike the Christian churches that have organized hierarchical uh, structures. We don't have that. So the very first thing that happened was our Muslim religious leaders came to us and asked us to help them organize a national network. So we did that for three years and organized the National Ulama Conference of the Philippines. Ulama means Muslim religious scholar. What was amazing, though, was that several women, Muslim women religious uh, leaders called Alimat, were part of the mix. And the women, the Alimat, came to us and said, could you help us organize a separate event, a separate meeting? Because they said, our issues are not exactly the same as the issues of our ulama. The ulama talk about peace and war. We want to talk about what they called women's issues. And what were these issues? Peace, health, education, financial independence, governance issues like corruption, human rights, and electoral reform. These are the smaller issues. So we've been working with the Muslim women religious uh, leaders, the Alimat, for the past um, one and a half years. And they have been moving quite fast on their own. We are encouraged by this because as the Alimat told us, we are the ones who have to ensure the survival of our families. And if we do not act, those of us who are here teaching in our local schools called the madrasa, the Islamic schools, then who is going to ensure the safety of our, of our families and children? Plus, they also saw the fact that religion has somehow become a flag, a banner, under which our communities are being divided. And we needed to make sure that religion would be taken out of the equation for conflict. And who better to address these issues than our Muslim religious, especially the women who teach in the Islamic schools. So they've organized themselves. They're called the Nurus Salam, and they're doing all kinds of work now. Uh, they're starting to organize to do work. They, and one of the focus that they have is Islamic peace education. We feel that if peace education is taught in our Islamic schools and perhaps other schools as well, we have laid a very strong, solid foundation for peace in our communities. Well, the next set of questions that we're going to address uh, is what is the impact of this work? Uh, what, is it working? How much do we know uh, about the successes and the areas where we still need to work uh, and where we need to improve. And just to highlight, we're talking about a range of activities that really starts with the individual uh, and the family, but is very active, particularly in the community, as Andy's example uh, illustrated, but which is also very much at the global level, where there are transnational movements uh, which are addressing many of the dimensions of peace. So we will hear first from Deka Ibrahim Abdi, uh, then from uh, Bill Kisu, and then uh, finally from Jacqueline Ogega. So. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Deka Ibrahim Abdi from Mombasa, Kenya. Um, I started my work in the northeast province of Kenya in a Muslim community, working with Muslim community in terms of trying to find 
resolution to our internal conflict, which was ethnic-based, but also political in terms of contesting state uh, structures. But the, the thing that I would like to share with you is, if you start your work in a context-specific area within your own community, but living in a state where you live with other faith communities, with, with Christians of diverse uh, institution, with uh, Hindu, with Jewish, with African traditional religion, does your local experience have relevance for other parts of the country? Does it have relevance for other faith communities? How do you transfer what you learned in your own community to other, to other communities? This was a challenge that came to me in 2008, after the post-election violence in Kenya, which was a sort of a political tsunami that completely blew up our country at that time. And in the Rift Valley pro province, our Christian communities who are affected by the post-election violence were really struggling in terms of how do we engage. You know, when, when the conflict happens to your own community, there's this issue of shock. There's this issue of inability to act because it is happening in your own community, the, the blockages. And I was requested by the, the Catholic Church to bring an Islamic perspective to the Rift Valley province of Kenya. So I traveled to the, to the Rift Valley province to uh, a Catholic community, both lay and uh, a religious community, men and women, and uh, coming to them and trying to share peace building from an Islamic perspective, peace building from the north, from a pastoral perspective to a farming community. And looking at that, uh, I would like to share with you some of the evaluations, what came. Uh, the reality was, when I arrived, they were not seeing a professional peace builder, a trainer who was coming to them. They were seeing a Muslim woman. They were just seeing a woman. So, and they were like, what is she going to teach us? She's from the north. She's a pastoralist. You know, these are just warlike people. So, but later on in the evaluation, they sort of said, Deqa, you are teaching us your scripture, what Islam means to you in terms of peace building framework. And you are forcing us to think of our own faith, to rethink in terms of our own strategies. That forced us to really look inward by looking outward you really forced us to look. And the women uh, in the Catholic Church who were there, who are earlier sort of seated in the periphery behind quietly, the sisters and the lay women, came in the front saying that our trainer, our teacher is a woman, a Muslim woman, so we can do it. And, and the, 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 the dynamics changed in the three days I was there with them in the Rift Valley, and in a small way, and blocked them emotionally to re-engage in their own context. Not just looking at their own scriptures, but looking at a different scripture, but re-looking back at in their own. So sometimes what it requires is that we always think that we have to do our, we have to stick with our own, but sometimes the learning comes by engaging with the other, with the other context, with the other scriptures. Thank you very much. Good afternoon all, my name is Bilkisu Yusuf, I'm from northern Nigeria and I'm a political scientist by training and a journalist by profession. I'm a founding member of the Federation of Muslim Women's Associations in Nigeria and the NGO works mainly in education and we have uh, developed our own schools, built them across the ages. There are about a hundred of these and we run hospitals also to provide services to our women in integrated maternal health care. In Nigeria, the issue of women working in the faith section has had considerable impact on the way we approach peace issues. One Women of Faith Network have been working with the Catholic women and the women from the Evangelical Churches of West Africa, ECWA, in issues they find to be community-based issues that concern women apart from the broader issues of conflict between Muslims and Christians and trying to engage the communities in dialogue. They've spread their own identification of peace into issues like sanitation, providing health care, and also poverty alleviation across board as women of faith. They go into these local communities in Abuja and do this work. 
In addition, we also consider the youth as a very important component of our peace works because a lot of the violence revolves around using the youth for toggery, whether it is in elections or when there is community violence, they, they, get, they take part in, in the violence. And we find this very disturbing. We find that the youth are the future leaders of tomorrow and there is need to involve them in youth activities for peace. So we had a hundred of these youth brought together working with the male dominated group, which is the highest religious uh, body in the country, the Nigeria Interreligious Council, NIREC. We brought these groups together and we provided training. We trained 100 master trainers who will go to different communities and cascade the training so that we can catch the youth young and hope that they will replicate this in their own communities at the lower level to build peace. We were amazed at the collaboration and the zeal to be able to do something. They were asking, what do we do now after the training? We established a website for them and they've been doing wonderful networking. We hope to involve them in additional activities. There is the issue of marginalization of women when it comes to issues of peace. They aren't visible. The men will do a lot of it. The peace process involves men. Women aren't seen to be part of that, but we are also working on ensuring that women get involved in this, and we are working with the male clerics. We may not stand up there and deliver sermons, but we help them contribute in developing sermons, whether it is on the issue of malaria, on the issue of how to implement Sharia, we also say we have a voice. Sharia is the Muslim law. It affects us, we are half of the population, we should have a voice. These are our issues. And these are the sort of things we want to see you talking about in your sermon. We also all have involved and worked with the clerics in, on the issue of HIV AIDS. The bulk of the infections have to do with women being infected and also the youth. So we also come in there, we work with the imams at trade, as uh, at workshops, we develop policies on HIV AIDS and we have them making pronouncements and statements in their sermons. We've also been working with them in building peace in troubled communities. Some of our communities are segregated, so we feel it is important to ensure this. Thank you very much. It's really a pleasure for me to be here and to speak with you all um, regarding the work of Religions for Peace. Uh, Religions for Peace is an international non-sectarian organization that's headquartered in New York. And the goal is to promote inter-religious cooperation for peace, uh, working with different religious communities as building blocks for multi-religious collaboration. How does this uh, multi-religious uh, mechanism work? Uh, building women of faith networks and interreligious councils, uh, youth networks, does it really work? And I'm very happy to share with you uh, that at the height of uh, the civil war in Sierra Leone uh, uh, over a decade ago, that uh, the, 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 the civil war had reached a stalemate. The, the, the gentlemen or the men who are uh, the, either the warlords or in the government side uh, trying to uh, they, they couldn't get into a discussion. The United Nations, other regional bodies like uh, ECOWAS had tried to get the warlords to speak with the government and it did not work. And they had reached uh, serious atrocities of amputation of uh, uh, human beings, using human beings as instruments really to fight their wars. Uh, so the, the, the Interreligious Council of Sierra Leone which is an interreligious mechanism of religions for peace, uh, was, the goal was really to bring together uh, uh, all religions possible in, in the country, uh, Muslims, Christians, uh, traditional African religions, women and men, to say what can we do to, to, to bring a difference. And because of the power relations among men, uh, you know, they, they were these uh, masculine people who want to be engaged in the conflict, the women were 
had the courage to, to say that we will be able to go to the uh, rebel group in the, in the bushes and speak with them about uh, starting a conversation, about bringing back our children. And so they deployed their maternal, uh, uh, maternal identity as mothers, as women of faith. And they went very courageous uh, to the bush to meet with the rebels. And when the rebels saw them, they had never seen women go to the bush because that was not the place for women. And the women said, we want to start by prayer. And one woman was recounting to me that this, this rebel leader looked at her and said, you know, you look exactly like my mother. And we prayed together with my mother um, every single day when I was growing up. And what do you want? And the women said, we just want you to re release uh, some of the children you have. And that single day, they released 50 young boys to these women of faith. Mm -hmm. And they prayed together. They said, pray, pray for us. Do you think God loves us? And the women assured them, of course God loves you. And please, our children, why don't we begin to have a conversation with the president? Why don't we end this war? And they touched the very core of this man who was so militarized, who was so combatant. And because of faith, the men began actually a process of peace building. The problem is that when the peace accord was signed, the women were not there in the picture to take any positions in the political process or to get any benefits from it. But it does work to engage women of faith in uh, conflict resolution. Thank you so much. The third question that we have grappled with over these two days uh, is the challenges that face uh, uh, women, uh, religious communities, uh, world communities in trying to translate this potential uh, into reality. Uh, we've, we're giving you a relatively positive picture here of what can be done uh, and what is so often hidden from view. But the challenges, as I'm sure you are well aware, are many. So the two people who will give you a glimpse of uh, the uh, challenges are Ashima Kol and Dina Miriam. Thank you, Kathleen. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm an independent uh, journalist and a peace practitioner, founder of an organization called Yaksha Reconciliation and Development Network. Yaksha in Kashmiri means together. I belong to um, Kashmiri refugee community of Kashmiri Pandits, the Hindus of Kashmir, who were forced to leave in 1990. Uh, I came back to uh, Kashmir uh, for healing and reconciliation around 12 years ago. And uh, uh, the reason was that I felt so strongly rooted to my Shaivite Hindu uh, Kashmiri traditions uh, and to the syncretic culture that I belonged to. There are many strengths uh, that I gained on the way and I used my inner spiritual resources and also the strength of all those in the Muslim community who also reached out to me. But there were many uh, challenges. The biggest challenge was breaking into the fear of both the communities. And those fears were mainly based on their own identities as religious groups. Uh, so breaking into those fears and, uh, uh, is, has been a major challenge. Uh, for that reason, it's a pioneering work. There's no work done in Kashmir with this perspective to involve religious leaders and uh, use um, the culture, religion, as a resource for reconciliation and peace building. Uh, the other challenge that I have faced is from the secular state, uh, which uh, refuses to uh, look at uh, the whole dynamics of religious communities that have come to exist in uh, Kashmir. And uh, religion is so much being used to divide people, but the inability of the um, state uh, to use um, uh, 
uh, within their policies and programs, uh, uh, action-oriented uh, policies which can address uh, this, these divisions based on religion. The third challenge that I have uh, come across and that I face is that uh, when I want to reach out to larger Hindu organizations in the rest of India who are inclusive, secular, and use civilizational and religious wisdom in their work, the many ashrams, and uh, many organizations like um, uh, the Art of Living Foundation, which is doing incredible work in the area of rehabilitation, and uh, the importance of engaging and networking with these organizations because they carry with them the uh, Hindu image uh, is, is, is a huge challenge. An equal challenge is to reach out to the youth uh, because as I said earlier, uh, the issue of identity and who am I is so deep-rooted. Uh, the 20 years of violence has really you know, uh, pulled them apart. Uh, and the last biggest challenge that I face is to uh, reach out to the women at the grassroots and bring them out of their homes uh, and engage with them to build peace in Kashmir. Thank you. Um, hello, I'm Dina Miriam, uh, founder of the Global Peace Initiative of Women, which is a global network of women religious leaders. When I started working in the interfaith community in the 1990s, uh, there were no women. I'd go into meetings and there would be no women there. So I began to ask, where are the women religious leaders? And I got two responses. The first was, we have no women religious leaders. The second was, why do you need women? So that, I took that as a challenge, and I began to look for women religious leaders around the world across traditions, and I found an amazing group of, of women, um, I, and, and so began building this network and providing opportunities for women to create, shape, and lead peace programs. So it's a myth that there are no women religious leaders. Um, what is true is that they don't have visibility. They're not known. Even today, people approach me and say, can you help me find women religious leaders from this tradition, from this faith, from this part of the world? So even though a lot has happened, and, and you will not go to an interfaith meeting and not find a woman today, but you'll find one or two in, in a meeting of 20 to 25, there, there's only token representation simply because there's still this invisibility. So it's an ongoing effort. Uh, to, 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 to build this uh, platform where women religious leaders can, um, can work on peace efforts. And I won't go into why that's necessary. I think everybody here would acknowledge that it's very much needed to have women in the forefront. The second challenge is overcoming the, the negatives associated with religion. And there are a lot of negatives. Um, the doctrinal differences, religion has been a tremendous force for separating and dividing people fundamentalism, which has been growing. But there are many positives about religion. Religion is deeply unifying. So we've sought to create spaces where spiritual, shared spiritual experiences can be a way of bringing people together. Recently, we were at a, organized a dialogue between Pakistanis and Indians, where there was joint chanting of the Quran and of the Vedas. And after two hours of joint prayer and, and chanting, the whole space was transformed. There was such a bonding and sense of kinship that there was no need to even talk about why we need to have dialogue. They were already in the space of shared spiritual experience. So we talk a lot about the importance of sharing our spiritual wisdom, our share, shared experiences, where we don't just talk, but we come together and sit in the silence, in our prayer, in our, in our meditation. That's an essential piece of, of peace work. It's an essential part. I can't emphasize the tr enough the transformation that takes place when people come and share their spiritual experiences. It's like a magic formula, and it would take much longer to, to talk about what that involves. Um, but it's, it, it's, it's more than just talking. It's actually going through a process of transformation. So religion has that potential to transform conflictual situations, to transform people's perceptions of each other. So 
the work before us as a human community is to enable the women to come forward and to do this work and enable religion or spirituality to play its to fulfill its potential and play its proper role. Thank you. Well, you've had a glimpse of the remarkable people, the remarkable stories, uh, and the remarkable discussion that we've had over the past days. I wish we could have everyone uh, share uh, their stories, uh, but there, there simply is not time to do so. Uh, but I do encourage you to read the interviews with each of these individuals, which give you much more uh, detail, much more of the stories of what they do, and the sources of their inspiration for healing, for transformation, and what this is all about, which is working for a better, uh, more just, and a peaceful world. What we will do now is to hear very briefly from those members of the group who are still here, one at a time. And we'll, we have two chairs at the end. So Karen and Catherine, why don't you lead off one at each end? Uh, I know Catherine has to leave. Um, so we'll, we'll start with Karen. And then Catherine, introduce yourselves very quickly. And you have your minute. <laughs> I am Karen Torchison. I am an academic at the Claremont Graduate University. I've started several uh, graduate women's studies programs, one in women's studies and religion, and another in applied women's studies. What uh, this conference has helped me pull together, provided inspiration and a lot of great ideas and terrific connections. Uh, I've just started a project in Southern Africa with the Global Women's Research Institute to bring together um, activists with academic researchers so that the knowledge of those who really work with these issues on the ground, these people here who know so much more than what is understood in the university really shape the research agenda. And as a result of this conference, there will be a major focus on peace building in this conference. I'm Catherine Pothig. I a, consider myself a transnational scholar activist. I teach in, Cambo uh, in Cambodia in an, uh, an applied conflict transformation master's program. And actually, I'm leaving to go to it tonight, um, where we bring activists from all over the region who are on pr practitioners who are involved in their own conflicts uh, to the program. And I teach in California in a global studies program also um, and peace studies there. Um, after 9-1-1, most of my work has been in Cambodia uh, studying a peace movement, Buddhist peace movement there. But after 9-1-1, I felt compelled to go to, to return to the Philippines where I have long networks to uh, study and talk to um, and do some research with feminist theologians, ecumenical feminist theologians there and ask them what do they think just peace meant in light of the multiple insurgencies and the U.S. war on terror. Um, and their responses uh, provided an intersection of those uh, kind of what they consider the problematic uh, from a theological perspective. And it raises and it raised for me then and continues to raise a question, a methodological question for all researchers and for all feminists doing this work. What methodology, what is my accountability as a white US Christian uh, feminist doing work with uh, Christian communities elsewhere uh, when they when their religious activity implicates my own country what is my where, where what space do I occupy what kinds of um, accountabilities and how can I be honest in that process it's, it's very difficult and so I want to raise that um, I think that's a very important feminist question to keep in mind thank you, thank you. and bon voyage yes, thank you. so Dee and Marianne. Good afternoon. My name is Dee Aker. I'm, I created and run something called the Women Peacemakers Project at the School of Peace Studies at the University of San Diego. And what we've been able to do for the last eight years is document the roles of women on the ground in their own cultures, in their own religions, um, who stayed there throughout tremendously difficult times, even if they've been IDPs in the process or in, in displaced people in the process or whatever. 
And out of that is coming a network of regional people. So it'll answer some of the questions about those of us who are also uh, from the United States going out and doing work, because we need a network of women in their own countries who can call on each other in the region to uh, empower each other and also understand each other better, because so many of the conflicts can be addressed regionally. But we also reach across a wide variety of folks. I'm Marianne Cusimano Love from the Catholic University of America here in Washington. But I also serve and work with the Catholic Peace Building Network that brings together practitioners and academics around the world from areas of conflict. And we partner with Catholic Relief Services, Jesuit uh, Refugee Services, et cetera, in that work. And I also work with the US Catholic Bishops Conference. What came out of this conference for me is some further distillation of some recommendations we would have for policymakers going forward and for uh, the U.S. government and NGOs to think about uh, the importance of making a space for women at the table in peace building. And in one way of doing that is to not talk about religious leader engagement, as has been the la language of the U.S. government so often recently. Uh, we're hearing uh, great encouragement from the White House about their interest in doing more religious engagement. But if you f frame it in terms of religious leader engagement, you're leaving out women and you're leaving out youth. So the importance of framing that uh, is as religious community engagement and make sure that that's the type of activities we're, we're asking the U.S. government to inter inter uh, inter engage and more. And secondly, to make sure that we're making room for God at the table, making room for the transcendent, for religion, for spiritual experience, because when you do that, it really transforms the process. You're opening yourself up in a humbling way, saying we don't have all the answers, and it really breaks the frame. So uh, asking policymakers and NGOs to consider ways to do that in our work. Hello, I'm Kristen Lundquist, and I'm with the Institute for Global Engagement. We're a, uh, we like to call ourselves a think and do tank. We pursue religious freedom uh, globally. Um, and we just started our women's peace building initiative um, actually this past January, so it's just a few months old. Um, and one of the things that I've really garnered from this conference symposium um, has been this idea of continued research around the definition of what is women's religious peace building, um, the convergence of the two dyads that Susan was talking about previously, um, looking at the religious basis behind women's motivation to pursue peace um, on the ground. Um, and so our initiative really focuses on empowering women's NGOs at the local level. Um, and so that's something that is really going to inform uh, our pursuit of uh, research and um, connections with um, women peace builders in the regions we work in. Hi, my name is uh, Filiz Odabas Geldiay. I'm here representing two organizations, Art of Living Foundation and the International Association for Human Values. They are uh, NGOs affiliated with the United Nations and present in about 150 countries. Uh, we are in a all the conflict areas, including Iraq and, and, as my colleague mentioned, Kashmir and mm, places like that, we do a lot of women empowerment programs. Um, this has been a, an amazing two days um, brainstorming session with uh, women from all faiths. And I think I feel very empowered and, and hopeful that um, as a result of this, uh, we will, um, one commitment that I can make on behalf of our organizations is that we have been organizing women's conferences at local and international levels um, since 2005. Um, and it's been attended by women from over 100 countries. And I would like to um, dedicate a, a portion or, or a part of our conference to focus on uh, women religious and spiritual leaders and invite them to talk about the work that they are doing in their own communities and acknowledge the uh, human values that unite all um, all of these faiths, those values that are common, uh, like um, integrity, uh, compassion, being helpful, um, and also um, re commit ourselves to create awareness about um, bipartisan legislation that is in Congress right now called the International Violence Against Women Act, um, something that we can all um, support and be behind. And thank you to all the organizers again. Thank you. So the, that'll do. Unfortunately, a, 
a lot of people have had to leave and there were some people who couldn't come. So that means you have more time for questions, but this, what, what I think you are getting is a wonderful cross-section of the kind of people. I should also mention that this was women and men, uh, even though we don't have any of the men who are at the table. <laughs> Um, my name is Joyce Dubensky. I am the CEO at the Tannenbaum Center for Interreligious Understanding in New York. And for the last 10 years or so, we've used certain criteria, in, including people whose lives and freedom are at risk, to identify religiously motivated peacemakers and then to study their work and to tell their stories. And in studying their work, we try to understand how they do their work and what techniques, if you will, are replicable and keep showing up across countries, across conflicts, and um, by different people from different traditions. Um, being at this conference reaffirmed for me that today there exists a vocation of religious peacemaking and women peacemakers who are religiously moved and motivated to do this work. They are all over the globe. And one of our commitments is to try to mainstream this vocation. And by that, I mean changing how religious education is done so that children can grow up with the idea that they can grow up to be a religious peacemaker, that a girl can grow up to be a religious peacemaker, to see these role models better. And for us to do that by networking ourselves, sharing our information, sharing the information of some of my colleagues here who I've met here who are doing similar work and making sure that people know about what they're doing as well as promoting what I do so that it will be known and so that more people can opt into this and help us to change the world. Thank you. I'm Ginny Bouvier. I'm a senior program officer for Latin America in the Center for Mediation and Conflict Resolution at the U.S. Institute of Peace. Is that my minute? <laughs> <laughs> and I'd just like to... Uh, <laughs> I'd like to mention a couple of takeaways and three um, policy and research implications. Um, I think the first is that we found that women, particularly women religious or religious women, are particularly well situated to contribute to reconciliation in war-torn societies. And we see this in a number of ways. First, uh, violent conflict, especially chronic violent conflict, creates embedded historical trauma. And some of the things that women are doing around the world, and particularly in Colombia, which I follow closely, are looking at how to reconstruct historical memory in a way that can contribute to reconciliation down the road. And this is very exciting work and very cutting edge work. Um, that's one area, and I think I would also just add the experience of Latin America tells us that these wounds will not heal by themselves, and they will not heal quickly, and it takes time, and it may even take time to address this issue. It may, not, it may be too fresh in the end of, at the end of the signing of the peace accords, but it does need to be done at some point. The second point, gender-based violence is a key issue for peace building. Um, we heard that of 300 peace agreements, only 18 referred to the need to stop gender-based violence. And I think that this links directly to the fact that women are not included at the peace table, and we can give statistics that would show that. Um, third, I think the areas of, uh, see, address, so addressing uh, gender-based violence is really a key part of a strategy for sustainable peace and reconciliation. Um, in terms of policy and research recommendations, 1325, UN Security Council Res Resolution 1325 that calls for greater participation of women at the peace tables is essential to getting these issues addressed. Secondly, the research, there's a need for more research on the relationship between domestic violence and violent conflict and war. And we've seen this in every stage of war. We see it in the reasons that people, young people join armed groups to get away from domestic violence, both male and female. We see it in, when the demobilization takes place and ex-combatants go back to their communities and the rates of domestic violence skyrocket. So the policy recommendation on this front is that DDR policies, when internationals support DDR, they need to be aware of these gender dimensions. They need to be thinking about programs to help women in communities where ex-combatants will be coming back so that they can be prepared and prevent the conflict that would emerge, can emerge and has emerged in the households. 
thank you. And I uh, tribute to all of my colleagues for your wonderful and inspirational presentations and also for leaving us with time for a discussion. So we're now opening up the fishbowl. The water floods out. The, um, uh, so we would uh, welcome question. There are mics that will travel around the room. Uh, and uh, you can address the questions to any of the people that you've heard from. Uh, and uh, we will we'll take a group of questions uh, and then uh, to, uh, respond. I also would encourage my colleagues, if you have questions or comments, to join in uh, the fray. So. I just want to, the comments part I want to include as well. Please feel free to offer comments as well. You don't need to have a question, but we welcome you into this discussion with us. Okay. Did I see your hand up there? Okay. Hello, William Carpet. Um, I'm wondering, uh, to the ladies who come from far away and, and in complex situations, uh, a multi-part question. Uh, are you able to use modern technology in your work today? And cell phones, internet, whatever. And uh, the second part is, if not, what, what types of, uh, t what technologies would you like to use and what prevents you from using them? Okay. Question over here. Hi, my name is Shilpa Sharma. Um, my question is, in the work that all of you have been doing, so I guess the question is for everyone. A few people mentioned um, human values and inter-dialogue. Inter my question is, are you finding that in any of your work you're doing a lot of work on commonalities rather than on what my religion is and what I can offer you? Are you doing, do you see a lot of work on what the commonalities are in, in speaking about human values and things like that? And how much of, how much, um, I guess, time and effort is given to that in your, in the process? Thank you. I, I'm very um, glad that you picked up on the word human values because I find in my line of work that sometimes when I mention human values, people correct me as if I'm saying human rights. And I say, no, I'm talking about human values. It's a, it's a relatively new term, I think, but uh, it refers to those values that uh, unite all civilizations, that is like a shared code of ethics that are common to all religions and in backgrounds and traditions. Um, I think um, it has been a very enriching experience for me to hear about um, from my colleagues who are affiliated with certain religions in this past two days. But I personally come um, feel like I'm representing all religions um, through spirituality. And uh, I find that this is less threatening sometimes and much more welcoming in so many societies. We are active in Middle Eastern countries where we thought we might not have been is welcomed, but it is not so. Um, our programs in Iraq, for example, we have trained 43 Iraqi women uh, in India who have come and taken this uh, training from us and they have gone back to their communities. They are covered from head to toe, very religious in their own religion, but they don't find anything uh, contradictory in doing what we are doing. So it's extremely encouraging. and. Um, I'm hoping that more attention and time will be given to study this trend uh, in, in societies. Um, um. Thank you. Are there any other questions before I turn it back to the panel? Okay. Hi, my name is Sama from the Osgood Center for International Studies. First, I would like to thank you all for your remarkable work that you did and this open dialogue. My question is for people like me that would like to take initiative to help, what can we do? What kind of action? How can we help you beyond the dialogue and beyond the work that you guys are doing? I would like to help. I would like to know if there is a platform of information that I can access to and see what I can do on the field. Thank you so much. Okay. one. We'll take one more and then do a round of questions and then come back. Uh, Mary Young, Focolari Movement. Uh, my question is, I guess, to everybody uh, who's on the panel. You began by saying that you were relatively, as women, unknown in what you were doing and hoping for, I guess, a better or a more uh, vision or more spotlight on your work. 
I'm wondering if you see any value at all in remaining, in a sense, kind of hidden so that you can go ahead and work where other people cannot. Okay, well, let's, let's um, everybody chip in as you, as you wish. We'll, the questions are addressed to all of you, so you can go at it as you choose. Are we going to sort of go down the line? Why don't we, yeah. Uh, okay, regarding technology, uh, I think some of my sisters here will have more to say about this, but I will say in um, the Palestinian villages I've been involved in, many of the women didn't know how to use computers, and it's the, after uh, asking for the Hebrew uh, teacher, that was the second thing they asked for. Um, in terms of co finding common ground, uh, two points about that. One, I think naturally women are better at finding common ground and similarities. That's where they tend to start, whereas men will tend to see what distinguishes them. That's a good thing. Uh, on the other hand, when you're doing dialogue, it's really important to move past that because you can get stuck on, you know, how you know how much we have in common, and it can be a real feel-good conversation. But you have to be in a safe enough place that you can start to explore after after you've developed the trust, uh, what are the real issues that separate us? Um, and uh, in terms of uh, what, what we can do, talk to me afterwards. <laughs> We're an all-volunteer organization. Uh, we love volunteers. Invisibility, I'm sure other people are going to reflect that was one of the key um, discussion points uh, during the conference. And we agree there are a lot of benefits to being invisible at certain times. Uh, with regards to technology, uh, we use the cell phone a lot. Um, landlines are, uh, don't work very well in conflict areas, but cell phones do. The Muslim religious have asked for English language training, and they have asked for computer uh, training, because they see the need to enter the 21st century, and they can only do that when they can enter the internet and not have to ask their 10-year-old children to do it for them. With regards to commonalities, um, interfaith, interfaith dialogues have brought out the, the issue of commonalities quite clearly. But unfortunately, at the local level, at the village level, interfaith dialogue is, is not that embedded. So we need to do intrafaith dialogue to, to look at commonalities and say, what do you really think about this? and in many ways say that we have to accept what makes us different. So the same is true with the uh, Palestinian case. Uh, accept the differences of the, the different faiths and the different uh, ethnic groups and coexist, live together. How to, how to help? Um, well, you could help us lobby for a peaceful resolution of conflict instead of uh, more military solutions. That would also always be very good. More uh, funds for education and for peace building instead of um, uh, bullets and ammunition. Uh, you could also help out our friends here at Georgetown so that they can uh, get to work immediately and bring us all together again, and more of us <laughs> next time. With regards to the, uh, the issue of invisibility, there are definitely times when invisibility is good, when we need to work through our male religious leaders, for instance, so that they can address the, the mass base to support women's rights as human rights. But there are times when invisibility is bad because then the, the development institutions, the donor institutions don't see us and then they are not able to provide us the capacity building that we need so that we can best serve our communities. Uh, just to add on, on the point of, of uh, technology, modern technology, uh, one of the elements is that uh, during peace processes or in violent conflict phases, people use technology for the war. They use SMS um, uh, text messaging to mobilize hit messages around the country. That happened in 2008, 2007, during the post-election crisis in Kenya. Uh, people use the, the blogs and the Twitters and whatever to put in messages of hate here and there. So because it's been used negatively, we have also tried to use in the peace movement positively in terms of working with service providers, working with the uh, mobile companies that any time you top up 
people were constructing counter messages, uh, and you, we, a lot of university students really helped us in constructing religious messages, secular messages, wherever, so that when people top up, a message will pop up to, which is countering what was going on. So that's one other element. And then in terms of mediation processes at the community level, and sometimes when we're doing uh, mediation, I was doing at the national level in Kenya, People feel, you know, how can I help? How can I support? The war machine is bigger than I. So sometimes helping the mediators communicate, somebody will say, will you pay for $2, $3 uh, airtime? And in that way, somebody feels, yes, I am contributing to the peace process. I am paying the telephone bill in a small way here, so supporting mediation processes. And then using radio and FM stations uh, to take information far dissemination of information. So yes, it can be used for violence and it can be used for peace. In terms of visibility work, yes, sometimes visibility is not good. And in my work, there is what we call under the radar work or off the record. Sometimes you don't want to, to be known. You, people just need to know the actions, but you don't know who is behind the action. So invisibility is sometimes excellent and doing off the record of the radar work is, is critical. But you really need to know when you need the visibility and when you don't really need. So that understanding is really critical. Thanks. Yeah, briefly, uh, as a journalist, we appreciate what we can do with mass media or alternative media. And use of technology, we, we don't rely, particularly when we are working at community level, we don't often rely on GSM, on internet, because in the third world, it's not available everywhere, nor is television. Radio is more of the thing that, that uh, you'll find that it is cheap, and everybody will have a radio set, including nomads while they are out in the bush rearing their cattle, they have it slung on their shoulder, and people are really well informed. The other one is using uh, the radio, for instance, as mass media to enhance alternative media. That is the media you use at community level, so that you songs, poetry, and people do imbibe messages like this. So in terms of that, we find uh, modern communication methods are, are very useful for enhancing alternative media. <coughs> visibility and invisibility, yes, very important for us to be visible when we have to be visible. And when we don't have to be visible, like my colleagues have said, uh, we don't have to be visible. One aspect of visibility that we liked in our community it's a recent phenomenon. We've always had female scholars uh, who are learned in the Islamic uh, tradition. And in my area, in fact, we had a heritage of Muslim scholars who had taught policy makers, those who are big men now, sat at the feet of women when they were small to learn the first few lessons. And, and this is a very important aspect of it. Now the women scholars are reclaiming their heritage. They want to be able to be come out in the public and. Uh, interpret the Quran. We call it tafsir. And because of the gap before that they had not been in that space, the men have occupied it completely. And now the women are trying to reclaim it. They are saying, no, it's not right to have women um, speaking out. Your voices are like your body. We shouldn't be heard. It shouldn't be heard. We shouldn't be seen. And the women said, well, this is not good enough. When we were singing and dancing, welcoming you at receptions, nobody raised any issue. Now we are claiming a spiritual field. We want to be able to commune with our own to say what is re relevant for us to learn our faith. Suddenly, it is not allowed. No. <laughs> it, it doesn't gel that way. And the men shut up. They knew they couldn't push beyond it. So there are times when you have to be visible to get to claim some space. There are times you do things uh, without being visible under the radar, as she said, or under the table. Whichever works, works for you. I just want to add to the question on uh, commonalities, um, especially when working with the uh, interreligious communities. Uh, it's, it's very difficult to find a common ground. But in order not to be trapped into that, I think the, the goal would be to develop common principles. And especially when you're engaging on a common challenge, you know, we found that uh, it's very easy for religious communities of different faiths to actually, um, uh, uh, you know, say if it's gender-based violence, it's a, a problem that engages all
all of them, so that difference does not become a problem, but it becomes, and, and it's not hidden. We acknowledge the differences, but it becomes a strength in analyzing what religious, uh, uh, you know, what are the religious teachings within each tradition differently that would prescribe violence against women, for instance. So it, it, it's not a problem, it's actually strengthening the, the whole purpose of collaboration and bringing in uh, difference as, as, um, as, as a strength in understanding the, the problem and agreeing that all of our religious teachings actually tell us not to uh, the, none of our religious teachings, um, uh, it, it kind of affirms the, the need to, to, to work together on a common challenge. That's, that's what we have found uh, with our work at Religions for Peace. And I wanted to just uh, emphasize that when it comes to visibility, we, we got to problematize the invisibility. Uh, because if, if we just take it for granted, then we will not see the problem. But when we problematize it, we realize that, okay, so women are supposed to be invisible, for what reason? And, and then we can be able to say, and, and what, so what effect that, uh, what impact does that have on their work? So when we problematize that invisibility, then we are able to say, uh, get the answer to that, to that question. And in terms of technology, you know, working in conflict situations, you can imagine, you can picture uh, uh, from, from our work, I've seen a, a community that has no basic, basic uh, necessities. You know, uh, you don't have roads, you don't have food, you don't have housing, uh, you don't have water. I mean, technology becomes secondary, really. Uh, you know, I, it, 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 but I think that um, there could be certain technologies that may be relevant in such situations. So I would imagine that technology would also be, uh, uh, you know, very specific to the context. Yes, um, I remember uh, uh, the grassroots women found commonality from different communities in the issue of domestic violence, and uh, but initially it was you know completely uh, denied that it exists within the communities. So, but when we trained uh, the women in the understanding of gender and violence and how cultures and religions sanction uh, violence, they started seeing it uh, that it exists. And that is when they used computers, they used computers to document uh, cases of domestic violence within their own communities. Um, uh, we use uh, cell phones extensively now that they are there. And especially during curfews and shutdowns, they're extensively used to keep uh, the energy um, going. Um, however, I remember very uh, an interesting uh, incident when the cell phones were not there. There was this young girl who used to go to a shop uh, that had a phone. And she used to call me up and we used to discuss. Then uh, she started saying that this man is very inquisitive, the shop owner, and he wants to know what we women are doing. And I feel uncomfortable now going to the shop. So I had to personally we, uh, meet that man and we had to gain his confidence. When he understood what we are doing, he became you know, very helpful in extending the facility to. So we have used um, these uh, um, technologies and uh, in uh, the future work that we plan with the youth, uh, once we take them through this process, um, we want to give them the tools with which they can go back to the communities and become community reporters and start blogging with a new perspective. Um, as far as your question on um, uh, the commonalities, yeah, the a dialogue group that uh, I was able to initiate, uh, we have been able to create a common ground. Um, but it's not just about creating, you know, it's uh, we women can do it. Uh, we can bring inclusive humanness into that space. But uh, the bigger challenge is to nurture that space, to protect it always, you know, and that comes from complete surrender to that uh, process. Um, about uh, being hidden and non-hidden, yes, there have been uh, situations when we just wanted to keep low. Uh, and there have been uh, times we, when we have issued press releases 
uh, because uh, we wanted to put pressure on the governments on certain issues that we wanted to raise. Mm. Thank you. I wanted to uh, address the question of what you can do. Uh, everyone in the world can do something. Uh, it, we all have a responsibility to uh, be part of creating uh, peace on the planet. Uh, we started off our discussions by trying to define peace, and it's such a broad area, as is gender, as is religion. So I think beyond what we each need to do in our own lives in creating a peaceful environment internally and externally, you have to find out what specifically you want to focus on. There's a lot of research that can be done to find an area or a specific issue. Uh, and, but but it's, it's, it's a process, it's a journey. And once there's the desire there to participate locally or globally, then you begin a journey. And you don't know where the journey will take you, but it's, um, it's, a, it's a wonderful journey to be on. I'm going to make just a couple of comments and then uh, turn to the rest of the group. And then I don't see any other people jumping up and down yet. But um, OK, so we have at least one more. Just a couple of comments. We, as we suggested, we wrestled with this invisibility question because, first of all, there are issues of safety. Let's be very clear. There are life and death situations. And sometimes, um, particularly in some situations, not being in the media or not being other places um, is, is, is a, a good thing. But I want to bring out a couple of dimensions. Um, we, uh, we are a, a group of people who are very different and who have experienced, I think, being women in very different ways. But there is, I think, for those of us who are older, something that is very clear, which is that when women are at the table, they're in significant numbers. There is a difference in the tone and often the process, but there's also a difference in the agenda. So to take a completely different issue, if you, if you do surveys of women and men in villages, their priority lists will often be different. So I think you got one illustration of, of that from Amina. Uh, the, uh, the unimportant issues like education and health and children uh, may not be on the strategic agendas. So seeing, as you often do in the religious interfaith movements or others, panels with all men or uh, photographs with, with all men is jarring in today's world. And, to add one other dimension to that, um, one of the impetuses for this kind of work is the awareness of a number of professors that almost all of the scholarship that's published on many of these issues is by male um, scholars and, and male leaders. But the majority of people who are taking the courses are women. So for one book that I was contributing to a very senior professor said, I can't face my students if we don't have a chapter on women. So, um, and then the, the final question, which again, you, you may get an impression from this group that, that these are people who are putting their lives on the line. They're doing absolutely remarkable work, and some of them have been recognized. But in the processes of recognition, whether it's the movies or whether it's the television programs. There is a systematic um, lack of, of visibility of women. So when we talk about visibility, um, we are, we're talking about uh, knowledge and understanding. In other words, who do we really understand the reality that's going on, or are we filtering out uh, for various reasons? We're talking about honoring people who are doing the kind of work that we want young people to admire. Uh, so that it is, um, it's not about uh, credit. It's, by the way, it is also about funding. In other words, that if it's not known, if the work is not known and it's assumed that it's unimportant, it does not get funded. And a lot of this work survives on an, on an absolute shoestring. Uh, so the, the, there, there are a lot of, um, of questions that go. So let's take uh, Joyce, and then the microphone comes to, oh, and Marianne. 
I, I love listening to Catherine because she always says about half of what I plan to say. Um, but you set me up. Um, the issue of invisibility, um, I, I think we need to understand it as not noticing, not seeing that the female voice is absent. So when you ask about what you can do, one of the first things you can do is in every setting be looking for women and be looking also to hear the voices of women from different and diverse religious traditions because that, that's a set of women's voices that are often not heard. Um, and I also want to talk a little bit about some of the downsides of this invisibility uh, which we discussed, which I think are really important. And one of the things that came out in our discussion was that because women are often not at the table, not on the panel, not the re resource expert, not on the board, not in the leadership position, unless it's suddenly no longer a very prestigious leadership position, and then the woman has it. Um, what happens is that we don't have role models for the next generations about what's being done and what's possible to do. And I think there's some responsibility for our female children as well as our male children to know that there is a full range of possibilities and ways of being, um, in, religiously, in peacemaking, and otherwise. The other thing is that the invisibility of women in positions of authority and power, and that's still an issue today, even though there are more of them in some places and at least tokens, um, is that um, it reinforces inequality. And it reinforces it because when women are invisible, and even at the times when it's optimal for a woman to be invisible, like when the woman helps the imam write the sermon, and he delivers it, and it's his sermon on a woman's issue with a woman's perspective. She doesn't get the credit. What happens is men are all knowing, and women still don't know that much. And that's the image that comes out from that message. Now, it may be tactical, and it may be valuable to be invisible at that moment, but it also serves, doesn't further other causes and other purposes. And sometimes you have to make a choice what you're going to do and how to do it and what's best. But I think that it's really very complex and it's not as simple as it, it, it's just good to be under the radar sometimes. It's a very complex issue and one worth struggling with and struggling with in this triad of issues that we discussed. I just want to pick up where Joyce left off about expanding the, the, the menu of possibilities. It's something we talked about a lot at this conference, the need both in peace education, uh, but also the need in policy circles. And when these stories aren't told, when they're not appreciated, we don't understand the menu of what is possible. And that's particularly important in areas where conflict is very severe and persistent. Because we know that conflict doesn't end. It often resumes later in a later form. It goes into dormancy for a while. So we need very much to hold up what is possible. And it's also important because, as we said, women are also often the victims of violence. So 70 percent of uh, civilian casual, uh, of casualties in war and civilian are women and children. 80 percent of refugees and IDPs are women and children. So by not having those voices at the table, you're not having the voices of those who are most affected by the conflict be able to talk about and speak to those areas. And, and finally, it has policy, fo it has policy uh, implications. You know, I was at a conference uh, with a lot of military folks, a very male conference uh, in the past few months, uh, and the discussion was on issues of demobilization and, and, and reconciliation. And the leader of the, the, the organizer of the conference and the leader of a panel discussion at the end of the day said, well, I think we can all agree here that really sometimes we just can't do reconciliation. A lot of times we can't do reconciliation. It's just too hard. And you know that's a very different output by a group of all male, non-religious non leaders. And that's a very problematic outcome. Um, so I think it's very important to sometimes break that invisibility and break that silence, because you get a very different answer uh, when other people are at the table. I just. I just wanted to add one piece to the, um, the question about what can I do. And I think you already started doing what 
is a good thing to do, which is asking questions. I would go beyond the noticing the absence of women at the table and women religious, where there should be women and religious, and start acting on it. Raise your hand. Where are the women? What do the women think about this? I think just begin to introduce those questions into the debate. And it also means, in whatever place you are, being self-reflective about it as well. We had at US Institute of Peace, one of the reasons we have Kathleen here as the gender advisor is that we began an internal examination among the women at USIP. It started with the women, but the men also got involved about where are the women on our panels? Why aren't they there? And we found, we documented our public events and found, I think it was 20% women 20 to 80 percent men on our panels and that began an internal process of change that began us looking for the women that I think has had significant impact on our programming. I mean it's not just that we're looking for who are the women we can put token on the board but we're looking who are the women who are doing things? Where are they? How can we get through to them? How can we make contact with them? So I think just as you're doing beginning to raise the questions about what you can do is really important. That's the start. Thank you. As I'm looking around the room, I see there's very few men here. And I'm wondering how important it is for men to support the women's movements. Is that how you gain access to resources? Is that how you get legitimacy with religious communities? Um, or is it solely a women's movement? <laughs> I think we could get a very resounding answer from everybody, but let's start with Kathleen. Clearly, yes is the answer. We need men desperately. And yep. we had some. <laughs> well, and that is the other, that's the other part of the story um, that Jenny was sharing. When we started our own reflexivity of figuring out why is it in this security and peace building field, men dominate and we think second about, well, is there a woman who could really speak on this issue? They're there, but there are all sorts of reasons. And I think that the field of religion as a field and the field of security are kind of similar. And I think it's something to reflect on because these have been male-dominated domains. And I would suggest to you there are almost the last of these domains to really be broken apart. Business has taken on women leadership. Our politics. I just read that the parliament, uh, the Women's Caucus of Pakistan has successfully succeeded in two new laws dealing with sexual and gender-based violence. I mean, it is possible. We are moving into these worlds, but the last two I will suggest to you, and why this event is critical, is security and religion. And it's going to change. <laughs> Can I answer that too? Andy. Uh, I want to just tell a, a story about the men because uh, as, we, as we started to look at women's roles in peacemaking, we found that um, women were participating in many different roles, many of which we had never thought of before, and they're invisible. Uh, I think the same thing is true for men who support women in their peace building roles. Ibtisam's husband, Subhi, is an amazing man without whom Ibtisam couldn't be doing this work. Imagine, she's a traditional religious Muslim woman from Palestine who's allowed to to travel all over the world, who's doing this incredibly radical work. Uh, her husband takes a lot of crap for this. Uh, within his own village, he's had to stand up to the norms of a good Palestinian man does not allow his wife to do this. Uh, without him, she couldn't be doing the work. And I think if we looked through a lens of where the men who are supporting this work, we'd find many, many invisible um, instances. I've received the signal that we have to uh, bring this session to a close. Uh, we, we have reflected a lot on the branding issue because there is an argument that, that having discussions with a, that are led by women uh, that are open are beneficial. But the problems are not issues for women. They're issues uh, for humanity. And we need to find ways 
to have a more diverse uh, set of voices that are contributing. But we're off to a wonderful start. And I thank you all very much. It was an absolutely remarkable symposium. And uh, we've uh, been very grateful for the chance to share it with you. We look forward to continuing the discussion. And we look forward to seeing you at the Riggs Library or just outside the Riggs Library where everyone here is invited to a reception. So thank you very much. Thank you.